Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our May 2024 CTSS quiz. I have 10 excellent cases for you. Uh, a lot of them are going to be somewhat challenging, and a lot of them are not going to be so much the final diagnosis for you that's important, but how you approach the case and how you think about the case. So with that, let's get started. In this patient with abdominal pain post-colonoscopy, the key finding is, well, when you think about patients who've had colonoscopy, and I'm talking about classic colonoscopy, what can happen? You can have a perforation, theoretically. You can have adhesions, and because of that, you can be more prone to splenic injury. I've seen splenic lacerations. You can have perforation. Once the patient has a biopsy, you can have perforation. You also can have bleeding. And just the patient may just have symptoms because colonoscopy is not the friendliest of exams. Well, in this case, you also can worry about pneumoperitoneum, but in these images, I don't see pneumoperitoneum. The spleen, I partially visualize. I don't see bleed in the left upper quadrant, so splenic trauma is not something I'm thinking about. I do not see evidence of a retroperitoneal bleed. When I look at the cecum, I see a clip which means the patient had a polyp and the polyp was removed. When you look carefully at the axial views and then looking at the volume rendered views, in addition to the clip, you see other high density zones. And this was bleeding in the cecum following polyp removal. One of the complications, and usually it's, it, it, it basically goes away on its own. You don't need to do any intervention, is you can get some bleeding post polyp removal. Uh, and this is a good example. So we told the referring clinician, they watched the patient. The patient was admitted but did fine. The best diagnosis in this patient with right lower quadrant pain is when you look carefully on the axials and coronals, you see a large tubular structure. Now, the odds are, in looking at the images, you can see it's near the small bowel but not from the small bowel. You could think about a Meckel's diverticulum. Remember, it's within the region of the terminal ilium and cecum. But Meckel's is not one of the differential choices, so that's what it can't be. I don't see any inflammation, so this is not acute appendicitis. You can have a dilated appendix sometimes, and it could be subacute appendicitis, but I don't see acute appendicitis. This is not Crohn's disease. The bowel looks okay. This is not a duplication cyst, though it's a possibility, right? Duplication cysts can rarely occur off the terminal ilium, so it's a thought process. But most likely, this is the classic appearance of a mucosal of the appendix. Remember, these can rupture, can give you pseudomyxoma peritonei. It's a very important diagnosis to make. In this patient with cough and fever, the best diagnosis is if you look only at the axial views, you see cystic changes with lots of destruction of the lung fields. Could be many possibilities. And then when you look at the coronals, you see it's mainly the real destruction in the upper lungs, but there are cystic changes in the bronchi throughout the lung. There are multiple areas of air trapping. Sarcoid can give you scarring in the lung and can cause retraction of the bronchi, but that's not really what you're seeing here. COPD is always a thought, but again, the dilated bronchi and the distribution really is not good. TB, usually inflammatory, obviously it's an inflammatory condition, airspace filling and the like. You can get bronchial thickening, but not such a diffuse, almost symmetric pattern. The best answer in this case then is cystic fibrosis. With cystic fibrosis, the bronchi are dilated, uh, you can see mucus plugging. You can see areas of lung destruction, as we do see in this case. In this patient with cough and fever, what's the best diagnosis? Well, when you look at this case, you can see there's nodular pattern in the left upper lung, and it's really left upper lung. So it's not cystic fibrosis, which involves the entire lung with dilated bronchi. Sarcoidosis can only involve a portion of the lung, and it can be challenging. Sarcoid has many different appearances, but I don't see adenopathy here. 
This is not the look of COPD. This is more the look of an infectious etiology, and the only choice I give you is TB. TB is more common in the upper lungs, can be nodular, can cause bronchial dilatation and inflammation. The best diagnosis in this case, then, is tuberculosis. In this patient with shortness of breath, the best diagnosis is you can see this patient is really short of breath and they're intubated. There's bronchiectatic changes in the lung and those changes involve the entire lung. There's also mediastinal adenopathy with areas of calcification. This is not the look of cystic fibrosis, just its distribution is not classic CF. COPD, yes, the patient has a uh, extensive lung disease, but this is more than just COPD. TB is a thought, but the involvement of the entire lung, TB can be a secondary infection perhaps with the adenopathy. But if you put everything together, you look at the bronchiectasis, you look at the entire lung involvement, upper greater than lower lungs, you look at the presence of adenopathy, sarcoidosis is going to be your best diagnosis. In this patient with acute back pain, the best diagnosis is, well, you can see this soft tissue thickening around the arch and descending thoracic aorta. I don't see a dissection flap. This is not classic atherosclerotic disease where you typically see the soft tissue thickening a few millimeters surrounding the vessel, often with calcification. There's no calcification here. You could think of a vasculitis. And that's, I guess I can't really exclude it. Something like Erdheim chester disease can give you lots of soft tissue thickening. But again, it may be more extensive in terms of involvement. You also would look at the abdomen. In this case, you can see the ascending aorta looks good. Proximal arch look good. This is the classic appearance of an intramural hematoma. When you look hard at additional images, you want to look for small ulcerations. Commonly, intramural hematomas often have small ulcerations. These patients can be treated conservatively depending on the clinical history and presentation. The most likely diagnosis of this case is you see a mass sitting within the left atrium, sitting adjacent toward the right atrium. It's lobular, it's soft tissue density, it's not vascular. Now, you could consider a thrombus, though this is large, though I've seen large thrombi, but the location pushes you more toward the differential of thrombus versus myxoma, and based on location, atrial myxoma is the best thought. Lymphoma typically involves the pericardium. It can involve the chambers of the heart, but that's by direct extension and infiltration, which you don't see here. This is surely not simply a flow-related artifact. This is a very nice example of an atrial myxoma. Atrial myxomas can calcify. At times, it can be a real challenge differentiating an atrial myxoma from a thrombus. In this patient with hemoptysis, the best diagnosis is... Well, what do I see? You see retraction of the airways, retraction of the vasculature toward the upper lung. So it's an inflammatory process. The rest of the lung looks okay. It's hyperinflated. And then when you look at the apex of the left lung, there's a mass present with air around it. This is the classic appearance of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis with an aspergilloma. Because the rest of the lung fields look good, this is not cystic fibrosis, it's not COPD, and it's unlikely to be TB, though TB can have many, many forms. This is more classic elevation of the vessels, elevation of the bronchi, cavitary lesion with aspergilloma, sarcoidosis is a great possibility, and that was the correct answer. In this patient with FUO and weight loss, the best diagnosis is, we look at this case on the image, on the first axial image, you see soft tissue infiltration of the pleura, maybe extending through the pleura to the chest wall anteriorly. You see also a pleural effusion. And on the lower scans, you see infiltration of the pleura again at the level of the diaphragm and liver. Now, mesothelioma is a consideration 
You can have multifocal mesothelioma, usually is associated with asbestos exposure, and I don't see any calcified plaques, and the imaging looks like a younger patient. Pleural METs is a thought, and you can get unilateral pleural METs in a patient with thymoma, but I don't see an anterior metastinal mass. Actinomycosis can cause chest wall erosion and destruction, but usually it's focal, and I don't see any chest wall or rib destruction. The best answer then is lymphoma. Lymphoma can involve the pleura. Yes, we always think about lymphoma as adenopathy, infiltration in the lungs perhaps, but it also can be pleural involvement, and this was a great case of B-cell lymphoma. In this 50-ish year old female, the most likely diagnosis is, when you look at the axial views, you see that the aorta at the level of the kidneys is narrowed in diameter and there's soft tissue thickening. When you look at the cinematic rendering, you can see it's not just a focal area of thickening and narrowing, it's really the entire aorta beginning just beneath the SMA down to the iliac vessels. It doesn't have the look of simply atherosclerotic disease and it's not a dissection. Retroperitoneal fibrosis is a consideration for narrowing of the aorta, but then you would see soft tissue infiltration around the aorta. There's a little bit here to make you think of retroperitoneal fibrosis, but more in this case, it's thickening of the wall of the aorta, which explains the narrowed lumen, and it doesn't have the extent that you would like to see with retroperitoneal fibrosis. On the other hand, Large vessel vasculitis is something to consider. And in fact, this was a case of giant cell arteritis. I don't think you always can be specific. Could it be Takayashu's? Could it be Kawasaki's? I mean, obviously Kawasaki's is more common coronary artery aneurysms and Takayashu's is more common involving the left subclavian artery. But large vessel disease and giant cell arteritis is a great choice. And that was the correct answer. Well, those were 10 really difficult cases. I gave you a number of lung pathologies. I thought that would be helpful in building our teaching files and building our quiz files. I'm trying to make certain that I have a lot of everything. And in the year 2024, I am trying to put up more chess cases. So I hope you enjoy that. And that's what many of you are asking for. Anyway, with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.